All right, welcome everybody. How exciting is it to be back in person, for heaven's sake? So, for those of you who don't know, I'm Carter Sneed. I'm the director of the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture. And it is so good to welcome you tonight to the 21st fall conference entitled, I Have Called You by Name, Human Dignity in a Secular World. When we were last able to gather in person for this marvelous event, we had the providential fortune to be discussing the topic of friendship. Little did we know at the time that we would soon experience a pandemic that would interrupt so many lives and deprive us of the joys and consolations of togetherness. And that's why we're so delighted to be here together once again to renew old friendships and to create new ones that will endure. These three days, each November, have been the highlight of the fall semester here at the University of Notre Dame. And tonight we gather to renew this signature event of the DeNicola Center. For those new friends who are joining us for the first time and who aren't familiar with our work, the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture was founded in 1999 by my wonderful and amazing and inspiring predecessor, Professor David Solomon. I don't know if he's here right now, but whenever I mention his name, I feel like we need to clap. The center's purpose is to share the richness of the Catholic moral and intellectual tradition through teaching and research and public engagement and service and public witness at the highest level and across a broad range of disciplines. We do this in four ways. First, we focus on academic research and programming, being a research university, being the Blessed Mother's Research University. Um, and the fall conference has become the centerpiece of our academic programming. It is the largest interdisciplinary academ academic event at the University of Notre Dame. Um, and as you all know, you're gonna be enjoying it in person. You're enjoying it hopefully now. Uh, and we also have several uh, publication series with the University of Notre Dame Press, uh, award-winning series. We've published 27 titles since 2016, including uh, previously untranslated and published works by Alexander Solzhenitsyn through, by operation of a special agreement with the Solzhenitsyn family, through our Catholic Ideas for a Secular World uh, book series, through the Bioethics and Medical Ethics book series, and through our African Theology uh, book series, uh, all in conjunction with our wonderful friends at the University of Notre Dame Press, led by the indomitable Stephen Wren. And I think we should clap for him as well because he's a very important person. So that's academic research and programming. We, of course, also the heart, the lifeblood of our, of our center and of this university, our students. We have a robust student formation program through our Soren Fellows program, named for the founder of this university, who, who rightly said that this university will not simply be a place of learning, but also a great force for good in the world. And the primary mechanism of that is our wonderful student population while they're here, and especially when they leave. Our Soren Fellows program started in 2014 with 12 students. Now we have 300 students in the Soren Fellows program across every major, across every college, across every dorm. Uh, and we provide individual mentoring and research and, and, uh, and support, as well as summer internships around the world. Uh, if you see a Soren Fellow, say hi and, uh, and engage them in conversation. They are delightful. That's not all they are. They're not just delightful conversationalists. They're also amazing young people, and it's our pleasure to help them to realize their vocations. So in alongside academic research and student formation, we also are the university's principal engine to advance its institutional commitment to build a culture of life from conception to natural death. In 2010, the university reaffirmed its commitment to, um, to the proposition in conjunction in accordance with the Catholic Church's teaching that every human being born and unborn is possessed of an intrinsic inalienable dignity and must be welcomed into life and protected in law from, protection to nat from, from conception to natural death. And we are the principal engine of that commitment. And we do so in a variety of ways, um, both here on campus and in the wider public square. Uh, and then finally, the fourth uh, element of our mission is that we support the university's commitment to hiring for uh, those elite and eminent faculty who are passionate, who share our passion for Notre Dame's Catholic mission, and who understand that Notre Dame is indispensable as the most important uh, uh, Catholic research institution in the world, and that as a university named for the Blessed Mother, we have to live up to that name, and that begins with hiring the right faculty, supporting the faculty who are here, recruiting, retaining, and cultivating and stewarding our faculty. 
Um, and so that is the fourth thing that we do here at the Dinicola Center for Ethics and Culture. And in all of these ways, we seek to shore up Notre Dame's distinctive Catholic mission on campus uh, at Notre Dame, but also to project the university's voice into the global public square in the name of human dignity, the, uh, uh, the common good, and authentic freedom as Notre Dame. So that's what we do. Uh, and since the center's foundation, the fall conference has been our largest annual event, uh, a truly unique and exciting gathering of scholars and students and friends from around the globe who come together every year to grapple with some of the most vital questions of ethics, culture, and public policy. We have more than 950 guests registered this year. It's a new record uh, for the fall conference. So thank you for coming, 950 of you. And as we spend these next few days together discussing the ideas of human dignity in the secular world, we'll hear from more than 146 speakers uh, across the range of disciplines, including philosophy, medicine, theology, architecture, law, bioethics, art, literature, political science, and more. It promises to be a truly exciting three days. Now, I would like to take a moment to thank you for your attentiveness to the university's COVID protocols during our time together this weekend. As you will have seen in the conference program, uh, the university uh, requires everyone, regardless of vaccination status, to wear masks inside campus buildings, except when eating and drinking. We have complimentary masks available if you need one, and we thank you for your patience, and we thank you for your compliance with the, with the protocol of masking when we are indoors. Um, we're delighted to have the beautiful new McKenna Conference Center across the street available to us. Conference registration, and this is important, is upstairs on the second floor as our majority of panel sessions. So if you haven't yet registered, you do it on the second floor of McKenna. Uh, we invite you to check out our publisher book displays in room 204, of which are, uh, uh, many of which are offering special conference discounts on volumes by many of our speakers. So now let me introduce our, this evening's wonderful speakers. We are incredibly honored to begin this year's fall conference with a presentation and response by two of the dear friends of the DeNicola Center, two very dear friends of my own and my family, uh, Dr. Jackie Rivers and Dr. Monique Chiro Wubenhorst. Dr. Rivers is a senior fellow at King's College and the executive director of the Seymour Institute for Black Church and Policy Studies. After graduating from Harvard College in 1983, Phi Beta Kappa and Summa Cum Laude, she had a fellowship in the Multidisciplinary Program in Inequality and Social Policy at the Kennedy School of Government and received her master's and PhD in African American Studies and Sociology while working with William Julius Wilson. She has spoken widely at Princeton University, the University of Notre Dame many times under the auspices of the center and elsewhere, the University of Pennsylvania, the Vatican, Stanford University, the United Nations, and in several other venues. She has contributed to the volumes Not Just Good But Beautiful, as well as The Cultural Matrix, co-authored with Orlando Patterson and published by Harvard University Press. The response to Dr. Rivers' remarks will be given by Dr. Monique Chiro Wubenhorst. Dr. Wubenhorst is a fellow of the Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture, a visiting fellow, and the former senior deputy assistant administrator for USAID's Bureau of Global Health. Prior to serving in this role, Dr. Wubenhorst served as an assistant professor in the Division of Clinical and Epidemiological Research in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Duke University Medical Center. A practicing obstetrician gynecologist, Dr. Wubenhorst received her medical degree at Brown University, her master's degree of public health from Harvard, and completed her residency at Yale University. Her research interests include adverse pregnancy outcomes and long-term health, as well as racial disparities in women's health. Please join me in welcoming the wonderful Jacqueline Rivers. Well, it is truly an honor to be here this evening. Uh, when Carter told me about the topic for the fall conference when I was here earlier this year, I was so excited and I said, Carter, I definitely want to speak. I didn't expect the honor that he has <laughs> given me of being uh, the keynote tonight. Uh, I am very grateful, thank you very much, Carter. And I'm grateful to be back here at, Northeast, at, <laughs> at Notre Dame. To be here and to see all of you in person, it's just wonderful, and I love the warm welcome that always comes when we are with the De Nicola Center, in particular from Margaret, who is just the warmest, kindest, 
most wonderful uh, administrator I have ever met. So thank you all very much. And as I listened to Carter talking about wearing masks, I thought of my poor husband, because I am the mask lady. I'm always telling him, pull your mask up, cover your nose. Isn't it true? Yes. So just to let you know, just to let you know that um, I am a mother in the black church, because that's what we old women get called when, we, uh, when we're in the black church. You're laughing, Mernie, because you know it's true. So I'm a mother in the black church, and I am the ultimate mother about wearing those masks. Um, so I am excited to talk tonight about this idea of dignity. And I want to talk about this very important concept which has had a major impact on the well-being of humans across the globe. It's an idea that's played such an important role in at least three arenas, in human rights, and that was really essential to the demands that drove the civil rights movement that made such a transform transformation in the United States especially in the South, and had an impact around the globe. But also, this idea of dignity is so important in international law, in bioethics, and tonight I want to talk first about what dignity means, looking at the work of scholars in jurisprudence such as Christopher McCrudden and Oscar Schachter, and work related to on bioethics by thinkers such as Leon Cass, Patrick Lee, Robbie George, and O. Carter Sneed. And I want to explore the implications of the conclusions for the pursuit of dignity and freedom for African Americans, and thus to develop one perspective on this issue of human dignity. In a highly influential article on human dignity, Christopher McCrudden traces the history of the concept, starting with ancient Rome. He notes that at that, in, in most of these writings at that point, it's really talking about honor that accrues as a result of office or status in society, and that it's only a minor theme in Roman writing, this idea of dignity as an attribute of every human being. But the Catholic Church develops that theme. In the Middle Ages, and then later in Catholic social teaching, based on the idea of the imago dei, that this is the source of dignity of all persons, that we're made in the image of God, and that therefore we're distinct from all other animals. But the idea also resonates in Immanuel Kant's writings, that each person is an end in and of herself, not a means to an end. And the key idea associated with Kant is of autonomy. But it's also picked up again in Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who develops a different aspect of it, not focusing so much on, on uh, autonomy, but more on equality and fraternity, and connecting it with the social context, with a more communitarian approach, and with the idea that access to material well-being is important to dignity. McCrudden concludes that there is a minimal core in this idea of dignity. That despite the varying ideas that have developed over time, it was really important in the United Nations Charter, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in the UN Covenants, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And the power of the idea, he asserts, is that it allows us to focus on the person rather than on the attributes of any particular individual. And yet at the same time that it includes the social context. Jacques Maritain played a very important role in the use of this term dignity in all of these UN uh, documents that I've mentioned. And the way he got around the uh, question of exactly what was in, meant by dignity was to suggest that the focus should be on the particular practices that 
people around the world, around the globe, could agree on that were necessary, and the practices they could agree should be prohibited. But McCrudden suggests that there is a limitation in this, because very different ideas were being uh, intended by all of these different thinkers, all of them wrapped up in this one term, dignity. Some of these differences were what does, but he boils down three key points, right? First of all, that humans, every human possesses an intrinsic worth, what he calls the ontological claim, and that that worth should be respected by others, the relational claim. And then that the state exists for the sake of the individual and not the reverse, the limited state claim. However, scholars are still arguing over what does intrinsic worth consist in? What constitutes respect for that intrinsic worth? What is the appropriate role of the state? So McCrudden leaves us still with the question, what is dignity? I found it helpful to turn to the work of Leon Cass, thinking, finding there is some direction to begin to answer this question about the undefined core of dignity that McCrudden pointed to. Cass explores at length a point that McCrudden mentions early in his history of the term, that there are two ways of thinking about dignity, that it's an attribute of a person of high standing or status due to their personal achievement, due to the office they hold, or some other honor that they've earned, but Cass really focuses on the idea of noble character, that dignity is not so much about the office or status in society, but really about human character. But he also embraces this idea that dignity is a fundamental quality possessed by every human being. So he's putting the two pieces together. He defends this notion of dignity as connected with honor and distinction when he states, dignity conveys a special standing for beings that possess or display it. It has always conveyed something elevated, something deserving of respect. This he refers to as full human dignity. And he associates it with the most noble actions, with selfless heroism, with sacrificial generosity, with the highest character traits to which humans aspire. He says, dignity conveys the presence and active display of what is humanly best. At the same time, he recognizes the notion of dignity as inherent in every human being. He finds value in Kant's view that dignity is the universally shared participation in morality, but he finds that inadequate, that it's an esoteric conception divorced from the earthy reality of daily life, which he asserts has its own dignity. Cass accepts Patrick Lee and Robert George's explication of dignity as an essential quality of every human being who has a rational nature, and that all such beings have full moral worth. He base, it's based, in fact, merely on being human, on our distinction from other animals. But it immediately leads, Cass says, to the question of what sets us apart from animals. Well, it is those very higher attributes of reason, compassion, moral choice. And this, in turn, leads to distinguishing between those who achieve these qualities at the highest levels and those who fail to do so. So we're back to this notion of full human dignity, the achievement of noble character. He argues that, in fact, the two are inextricably connected, this idea of basic dignity, which belongs to every human being, and the idea of full human dignity, our, noble, our noblest selves. Full dignity cannot exist without the basic functioning of the body, the basic human dignity. And basic dignity is re rendered dignified by its support for the aspects of human nature the lofty aspects of human nature, because a human being shares in the godlike powers of reason, freedom, judgment, and moral concern, and as a result, lives a life 
freighted with moral self-consciousness, he writes. He continues, the inviolability of human life rests absolutely on higher dignity, the godlikeness of human beings. Full human dignity is achieved in noble actions, which are driven by the aspiration to highest values, but which require the mundane bodily functions that are tied to basic human dignity. Cass goes on to point to what he calls intimations of transcendence, that our full dignity lies in our uh, getting as close as possible to being a reflection of God's image. We're made in his image, and in our aspiration to be as much like him as possible, we realize full human dignity. It is at its best when we acknowledge and celebrate the divine. So full human dignity leads to the longing for God. Cass and Lee and George make a convincing argument that all human beings inherently have dignity. They have full moral worth because of our being distinct from animals, because we're made in the image of God. And the implication is, as McCrudden states, each person's dignity should be respected by others, and the state should act to support and defend the worth of each person. And I would add that every person is due full access to achieve full human dignity, the opportunity to be her noblest self. But severe deprivation can have a devastating impact on dignity. Not every human being lives up to our full dignity. And some face obstacles, severe obstacles in doing so. I'm reminded of a story told by Eli Wiesel in his book, Night. When he was a prisoner in a Nazi concentration camp, and German workers were passing the prisoners, and one of them just threw a bit of bread into the camp. And the ensuing melee as men fought each other for a tiny bit of bread was absolutely the contradiction of that full human dignity that Cass is talking about. Extreme deprivation that stands in the way of realizing our noblest selves. Tonight I want to think then about some of this in the light of the experience of black people in the United States. Surely, in the state of slavery, African Americans were denied so much. And in fact, every effort was made by slaveholders to reduce them to a subhuman status, to the, being the natural slaves that Aristotle wrote about people who were just human enough to obey orders and carry out demands, but not human enough to have a will of their own, virtue of their own. But in the antebellum period, it is so clear that enslaved African Americans rose above that as they embraced the teachings of Methodist and Baptist ministers in the uh, Second Great Awakening. They were pursuing freedom from slavery. But they accomplished another level of freedom. They were able to assert their moral superiority over those who call themselves their masters because they recognized the depravity of the action of those who would enslave others. But they recognized their own moral worth as they embraced faith and rose above their position of enslavement. They found a different kind of freedom. So basic human dignity is never quenched. And the longing for God, even in the face of severe deprivation, can restore and preserve full human dignity. And it's a tradition that continues. I said I'm a mother in the black church. And uh, indeed, I get to see the intensity with which black people pursue faith. According to a recent study by the Pew Research Center, black people are the most 
uh, devout demographic in the United States. I'll just give you one statistic. 79% of blacks say that religion is very important to them. And dare I say it here, Carter? Uh, only 66% of Catholics say the same. <laughs> in fact, according to that report, the practice of black people who are unaffiliated with any religious organization in terms of daily prayer and belief in God is about the same level of the average Catholic. So this longing for God as a route to human dignity and to ultimate freedom is still very much at play. But I want to turn to one more scholar thinking about dignity. Cass has this very general discussion of dignity, which I found extremely helpful, but it still doesn't fully answer McCrudden's challenge to what is dignity. And Oscar Schachter applies Maritain's approach, defining the implications of human dignity for action rather than attempting to work out exactly what it is. Schachter writes, no other ideal seems so clearly accepted as a universal social good. He spells out some of the practical implications for what he proposes would be widespread, would receive widespread acceptance and that would maintain the dignity of all persons. First, he notes, there must be a strong emphasis on the will and consent of the governed. So he, he names a number of different things that he thinks are important to human dignity. And this idea of the consent of the governed is something I want to talk about as I apply his framework to African Americans. I want to come back to that. He talks about it being completely unacceptable to demean individuals or groups to protect each person's self-respect. And here I want to talk about something which our daughter is passionate about, and that is this notion of how do we prevent algorithmic racism. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the term. I see some nods and some mm -mm. All right. And then he goes on to say that dignity is clearly negatively impacted by extreme material need. Remember the story about Eli Wiesel and the piece of bread. So he, Schachter says, provision of economic justice is a key requirement for defending the dignity of all. Great discrepancies in wealth and power need to be eliminated in order to avoid extreme power relations between individuals. He recognizes there's a clear tension between the pursuit of this equality and the curtailment of freedom it applies for some individuals. But this is very closely related to Something else he proposes, full access to educational and employment opportunities in order to allow the achievement of full human dignity. And he notes the importance of access to medical treatment. His conclusion is that rather than asserting rights, which then you can get into competing rights, uh, rights of freedom of speech, uh, rights of property, Rather, we should protect the dignity of all by providing education, education, financial support, access to employment. So of vital importance in thinking about dignity, for African Americans, certainly, are the laws, the markets, the social arrangements that govern life in the United States. Let me start by saying that there has been a great deal of progress. We are a far way from where we were when African Americans arrived here as slaves. There's been, or even the stage that followed slavery, Jim Crow. There's been the elimination of explicitly racially discriminatory laws. There's greater access to education and employment. There's even, especially among young people, the widespread embrace of black culture. Uh, and that's worldwide. My husband and I traveled as far as Chile only to find that what the young people were talking about there was hip hop. So we're a far cry from where we were in the days of slavery. But I want you to consider tonight that the dignity of African Americans, of blacks in the US is still under assault. Even though these insults are much less intense than they were. 
If we take Schachter's analysis seriously, if economic deprivation and inequality are insults to human dignity, then the in the socioeconomic realm and in other ways, there is still much to be done to defend the dignity of blacks. Let me give you some, I'm a, I am by training a sociologist, let me give you some sociological data. So race affects access to employment at, and it's easiest for me to illustrate this for you by looking at the low end of the socioeconomic ladder. Noted sociologist Eva Pager conducted a study in 2003, uh, an audit study, where she was looking at callback rates for applying for jobs. She sent out pairs of white testers and pairs of black testers to apply for entry-level jobs in the Milwaukee area. And these pairs were matched for sort of self-presentation, uh, they were matched in terms of how employers were likely to be impressed by how they looked. But they were given concocted resumes. And re some of the resumes reported that the man had a prison record, and some did not report that. And what they did was to randomly assign a resume to one, pair of te to one person in the pair of testers, and then at the next job application, they would flip so that every half of the time, person A was reporting a, uh, a prison record, and half of the time, the, that same person was not reporting a prison record. And some of these people were black, half were black, and half were white. And what she found was, without, whites without a criminal record were called back by employers 34% of the time. That's pretty good, right? Naturally, with a criminal record, white men, their callback rate fell. It fell markedly, down to 17%. Blacks with a criminal record only got a 5% callback rate compared to 17%. But what is even more shocking is that blacks without a criminal record had a 14% callback rate, three percentage points lower than a white man who reported a criminal record there are still insults to the dignity of black people operating here. I want to talk about another study on callback rates. This time, the employers didn't actually see people, they just saw resumes. And each resume was assigned a name which had been tested and found to be either evocative of a black person or a white sounding name. So maybe Becky, a white sounding name. Lakeisha, <laughs> black sounding name. And this was done in Boston and Chicago. And they created these resumes that also varied on um, quality. And they, had, they sent these resumes out in response to wanted ads in sales, admin support, clerical support, and customer service. And they randomly assigned to the resumes either a black sounding or white sounding name. And what they found was similar to the work of Pager, that resumes that had a white sounding name attached had 50% more callbacks for interviews. A white, the chance of having a callback if the resume had a white sounding name attached was 10%, and if it was a black sounding name, it was only 6%. Blacks would have to apply for 30 jobs to get as many interviews as a white person would applying for 20 jobs. They'd have to apply to 30. And she found, the, the researchers found that this held across industries, occupations, and employer size. Okay, I want to suggest that another area where the dignity of blacks is still at issue in this country is in residential segregation. There's been historic residential segregation. There's been redlining. There have been racial covenants. But I want to look at something more recent. Race affects where people want to live even in the 21st century. Camille Charles did a study of residential preferences in Los Angeles uh, in the early 2000s and found that 20% of whites preferred neighborhoods with no black households in Los Angeles. And on average, white respondents 
uh, preferred neighborhood would be 53% white. Thomas Shapiro did a similar multi-city uh, multi study. He found slightly better results. He found that whites did, he still found that whites preferred to live with other whites, and that 13% of whites wanted to live in all white neighborhoods. His data is from 1994. And another 34% wanted mostly white neighbors. That's 47% of whites wanting to live in all white or mostly white neighborhoods. Shapiro goes on to point out that there's a gap actually between what's reported in a survey like this and what people actually do. So he studied data on how people moved between 1984 and 1994 and found that out of 1,000 moves of white families, 984 stayed in mostly white neighborhoods or moved into mostly white neighborhoods. A far cry from the 43% that people reported. He also found that they moved out of or avoided integrated communities. The result, Shapiro says, is that blacks are concentrated in neighborhoods with weak public services, hospitals, transportation, police, and fire protection. If extreme deprivation is an insult to human dignity, it's still an issue for black people. He then turns to the impact on education. He says, residential segregation by economics and race is a principal reason for unequal educational resources. And Shapiro is just one of a long list of scholars who have documented this. White's residential choices have an impact on educational segregation. Shapiro reports that 96% of fa white families with school-aged children who lived in predominantly white neighborhoods in 1984 continued to live there or moved into comparable neighborhoods in 1994. And only 69% of white families who were in mixed neighborhoods stayed in neighborhoods like that in the same period. His research shows that most white families send their children to schools in mostly white, well-to-do neighborhoods. According to Shapiro, this is due to whites' access to intergenerational wealth, which allows them to get as, uh, assistance from their parents, allows them to make down payments on homes they could not otherwise afford. So intergenerational wealth reinforces residential segregation because you can buy a house in an expensive white neighborhood if you have rich parents and grandparents. Due to the historic restricted access to ho the housing market and to benefits from uh, the New Deal, such as the GI Bill, blacks don't have comparable wealth. They can't make the same choices. So this differential access to education is not due to preferences of black families. In fact, Shapiro's research shows that parents have similar aspirations for kids regardless of race or class. Almost half of whites would reject a school, he says, where more than 50% of students were minorities. And it's not necessarily because of the performance of the schools. These parents, he found, viewed whiter, richer schools as superior even before they looked at or without ever researching the performance of schools, without ever looking at test scores or any other measures of quality. They assumed if it was a whiter school, it was a better school. Some of them reported their kids were actually doing pretty well in the school where they were, but they moved them precisely because they wanted them in a whiter school. All of this reinforces this residential segregation we've been talking about, and it results in blacks being concentrated also in neighborhoods with weaker education systems. So I want to turn to this unusual idea of you know, those are long-standing problems. Employment, housing, education. What about what's happening now with the development of new technology? So algorithms that apply big data to current societal problems, like homelessness, or to tasks such as employers selecting job applicants, incorporate hidden discriminatory assumptions. In one case, retention of employees was related to the distance between the employee's home and the employee's job. But that was also highly correlated with race due to the very problems of residential segregation we've been talking about. 
So implementation of an algorithm for choosing employees based on this distance from your workplace would unfairly disadvantage black people. And increasingly, decisions like this are being made by unthinking computer systems that cannot exercise discretion, can't recognize historic discrimination, can't take individual circumstances into account. And at the same time, the use of such technology provides the appearance of neutrality and fairness. There's no biased individual making these decisions. Let me give you one more example from state government. When the state of Indiana switched to computer-based systems for approving applications for food stamps, for Medicaid and for other benefits, no longer were applicants who were disproportionately black supported by human beings, but they were left to negotiate complex systems, application systems on their own and had applications denied for the slightest error due to the exacting standards of the technology. And these were errors that any human being would have easily seen and would have been readily corrected. But instead, one million applicants were denied benefits in the first three years, a 54% increase in the rate of refusal. And then I want to give one last example that I hope will show that dignity is still at issue for African Americans. And it's one which historically has been very important for black people. But ha there's a new wrinkle. And that is the right to vote, which was denied to blacks by white supremacy in the Jim Crow South. The protections of, the, of voting rights that were provided by the Voting Rights Act of 1965 have been eroded by a recent Supreme Court decision which removed federal supervision of changes to the law governing voting in nine mostly southern states. And then a follow-up decision this year ruled that the laws in Arizona did not violate Section 2, which is seen to be the only section of the Voting Rights Act that has any teeth now. But even though it appears to narrow the reach of the act to limit exclusion of minority voters via rules regarding mail-in voting, voter ID requirements, and access to ballot boxes. OK, so these changes are all said to prevent fraud. How big is the fraud that's out there? Is this really something urgent? In a detailed scholarly study of claims of voter fraud by Rutgers professor of political science, Lorraine Manit, she found that studying the issue carefully based on information requests to all 50 states and on a wide variety of other sources, there were few cases of deliberate voter fraud in the US. Though there were some cases of unintended fraud, people who didn't know that they had the right to vote who went ahead and voted and that the claims of fraud were overblown. Furthermore, she found that there were adequate, adequate protections against fraud in state and federal laws already. Okay, she's a left-wing professor. You know, what do you expect her to find? <laughs> but what about Forbes? Forbes is a highly respected financial media outlet. Surely they're not left-wing. They report that the Mito Corporation, also hardly your left-wing uh, radicals, examined voting records in eight states for the 2020 elections, including Georgia and Pennsylvania, and found no statistical difference between the voting results from the, the, the questionable Dominion voting machines and other machines, no suggestion that votes on those machines were altered. They also examined claims of ballot harvesting in Georgia, found no evidence that votes had been tampered with, and Similar for evident, no evidence for ballot box stuffing. Ballot dumping in Michigan was not supported either. Though there were some errors, they said, uh, that, but not sufficient. They were caught in time, and they weren't sufficient to uh, affect any outcomes. All right, if Forbes is not good enough, how about Bloomberg? They're pretty, they're not, they're not, right, not far enough, right? OK. <laughs> We don't trust them either. All right. Bloomberg, look, I, I, I'm judging from my, my brother in Jamaica who, and his son uh, who love Bloomberg. And, you know, they are, they're the ultimate market guys, so I thought that they would be good, a good source. What can I say? But they did an investigation of voter fraud in July 2021. They, they also requested information from all 50 states 
And if you don't know it, the Heritage Foundation maintains a database on voter fraud. They also investigated the cases in the Heritage Foundation database. What did they find? That since 2018, only 200 cases across this entire country of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, 300 million people, only 200 cases of voter fraud were worthy of prosecution. In 23 states, not even one case. And in states where Republicans controlled both the Secretary of State and the Attorney General's office, there were only 59 cases. So even in Republican-controlled states, only 59 states were worthy of prosecution. The Democrats actually did better. In states that the Democrats controlled, well, I don't, you know, we need to, we don't want to fall into the base fallacy. We don't know how many states Democrats control, but in those states, 102 cases were uh, prosecuted. And in states where the control was split, only 35 prosecutions were reported. At this level, fraud is far too low to affect the outcome of any elections. Despite that, 19 states have enacted laws that restrict voting. Florida, Iowa, Georgia, and Texas have passed omnibus bills with several new restrictive provisions. Most of them focus on reducing access to voting by reducing access to ballot boxes, reducing uh, times that uh, voting can occur, you know, operation of polling stations. There are also stricter requirements for voter IDs uh, in seven states and restrictions on mail-in voting. But these restrictions disproportionately affect black people and poor people. They're the ones who have the jobs. They're the bus drivers. When you're a bus driver, you have limited time off. You can't say I have to go vote. I'm not going to drive my route. They are the ones who have the kind of jobs that don't allow them to get time off, the luxury to go stand in line and vote. And they also have the kind of lives where they are working multiple jobs, where they have no help with children at home, where outside of voting hours, outside of business hours, they have little time to go and vote. These are the people who are being affected by these laws in a situation where there is no clear reason to implement these restrictions. All of the studies show that there is not fraud at the level that requires this response. So in conclusion, employment, housing, education, these are long-standing situations of great inequality that's reflected in a massive wealth gap. The average black family holds one-tenth of the wealth of the average white family, one-tenth. In fact, inequality is so great in uh, the city where I live, Boston, that the average black family is worth $8 and the average white is worth a quarter million in terms of wealth. So this is gross inequality according to Schachter and insult to dignity. And in developing areas like artificial intelligence, old patterns of inequality are being inscribed into supposedly neutral algorithms, the rules that decide how this software makes these decisions. And in voting, an old problem is developing a new dimension. As low voter participation among African Americans is exacerbated by pressures, by measures to address a clearly non-existent problem. But blacks still pursue freedom and dignity. Blacks assert their dignity despite these barriers. The hardworking lives of millions of black Americans who struggle against these barriers which they confront. The massive outpouring of protest against violence against black men. The faithful service to the poor of black churches, themselves poor. The longing for God expressed in the devout lives of so many African Americans. And I urge that we should honor the dignity of black Americans who are still working for freedom, freedom from want, still working for that full human dignity, 
by defending their right to vote, not making it more difficult for poor blacks, by confronting racial bias that's being built into the algorithms and rejecting the facade of neutrality, by keeping human compassion and discretion involved in decision making, by working to reduce residential segregation and educational exclusion, as Carter Sneed says, to be aware of the unearned privileges that so many in the US enjoy, but that are denied to black people. To examine the impact of history of segregation and discrimination. To see how the dignity of black people, still working for freedom, still working for dignity, who, like all people, share the Imago Dei. Thank you. my time around. Good evening. And uh, it's a real honor to be here once again. I'm just amazed by the number of people who've come out. And uh, want to um, thank uh, Carter Sneed and his amazing staff, including Laura Gonsorek, Margaret Cabanis, and our media, our media men and media people, um, as well as uh, just acknowledge the amazing biblical hospitality we've experienced. So in beginning, I would like to applaud Dr. Rivers' cogent application of human dignity to the plight of many African Americans. She's also done me quite a service, the great service actually, of helping me to delve more deeply into authors with whom I'm not as familiar as I should be. Um, I also appreciate that Dr. Rivers has brought to light these startling statistics, uh, showing the deep gaps in our society so that we can have <clears throat> needed dialogue on this. It's difficult to talk about these subjects, um, especially in the current uh, milieu where we are faced with immediate, sometimes negative reactions, trying to talk about issues around um, inequality, poverty, so on and so forth. And I'm also very appreciative of her discussion about the human person. In particular, during my time at USAID, we fre frequently went to battle on the concepts of uh, what is an unalienable or inalienable right <clears throat> versus other rights, because there are always attempts to promote and create new rights. For example, the right to electricity. That was always a great one. And so um, I won't take too long, but I do want to make a few points. First, underlying Dr. Rivers' concept of human, human dignity is something that I think we should all put on our radar screens, and that is a doing away of the, with of the concept of race. You know, we use race like a potholder. We use it to, because we, we have been taught and academia and society have focused on it. But really, actually, I hopefully we're all aware that it's really not a scientific concept. If you look at uh, data, for example, on mitochondrial DNA, you see that we all have a common ancestor in East Africa. So we're all related. There were not three separate sources of humanity or four separate source, uh, sources of humanity springing up in different places. And the idea of race um, probably developed even prior to the social Darwinists during the Age of Enlightenment. And so um, Darwin, oh, actually, I have a slide here. Oh, I forgot. I'm always supposed to do this. I have no commercial uh, <laughs> conflicts of interest. I would, I would like to say one day that I do have a commercial conflict of interest because I'd be making a lot of money, but I don't. So anyway, OK. So, um, so uh, uh, just moving on from that, um, one of the things that uh, we saw, uh, we have seen in the concepts of race is that arose from ideas like this. This is actually from um, Darwin's book. It's a quote from Darwin's book called uh, The Origin of Species, subtitled The uh, Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Survival. And so you can see it's not very complimentary to Aboriginal people or African Americans or others. But I think that, um, we, we really do, I think, fundamentally, as ethicists, as moral philosophers, um, as people who have faith in God, need to begin to really dismantle this idea of race, because um, it is unbiblical and it's unscientific. Okay, I'll get off that, that rant. Um, 
I appreciate that Dr. Rivers uh, spent a lot of time talking about microtomy because I think that his works on, on human dignity is just really fascinating. And he talks about how resorting to art forms um, can help us to uh, understand problematic, problematic concepts in law and moral philosophy. Um, and he talks, of course, as she's indicated about the evolution of moral philosophy and the concepts of human dignity. And so I want to, for the remainder of my time, focus on some ideas um, in this particular painting, which is called uh, Las Meninas, um, because he had a way of sort of um, unpacking this and looking at this in ways that I think can speak to these difficult and sometimes um, even challenging topics that we're talking about. So in On Human Dignity, he examines Diego Velasquez's painting, Las Meninas, and uh, his portrait of Juan de Pareja, which I'll show in a moment. And so um, one of the things that's very interesting about these paintings, and especially this painting of Juan de Pareja, who was actually Velasquez's slave, and he was later feed, freed by Velasquez. He was a Moor, which meant that he was of North African um, extraction. Um, and then you can also see the dwarves, the two people on the right who were dwarves, which who were really not even considered human in this society. But um, one of the things that he really does very successfully in both of these pictures is to enable both the dwarves and this person here to have an agency and a dignity, which is really quite remarkable at the time that he was painting. And why is that? Because they are showing examples, exactly as you just said, Dr. Rivers, of dignified behavior in the face of adversity. The slave is proud, even though he has still a slave, and that he is acknowledging that, yes, you're looking at me, but I'm looking at you too, and I'm looking at you with my head up. And I think this is sort of encapsulating something that Dr. Rivers was talking about, which is that tension between the experience of inequality and um, history of slavery and the desire for human dignity among African Americans. The human person is sacred. We're agreed on that. But when did that happen? Dr. Rivers has framed this in describing the paradigms of dig dignity from antiquity to the present time and the, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, and the roots of this humanist, of a humanistic concept of dignity in the Middle Ages where dignitas humanus is presented as a counterpoint to miseria hominis. This was ba based on the contempt to Mundi, which was laid out by Bernard of Clairvaux, Bernard of Cluny, and others influenced by Augustine. And there's an essential tension between this, isn't there? There's a tension between the dignity, the dignitas humanus and the miseria hominis in that humans who are made in the image of God are nonetheless fallen. And so to what extent do the effects of the fall control the new man in Christ who's renew renewed in the image of God, according to Ephesians 2? So dignity is a creation thing. It's not a redemption thing. In other words, it does not depend on the redemption of a human being. But as redeemed human beings, we have an expectation that dignity is able to be recognized in any human being at any stage, no matter what their vulnerability is. So leaving that for the moment, the optimistic view of dignitas humanis led to serious flaws in the resulting view of human dignity because such dignity was based on a human being's ability to develop morally toward, a ideal of, toward an ideal of spiritual enlightenment. But what happens when reason is absent or diminished? Does that destroy the concept of dignity in the human person? And we know that um, prior to the, around the 18th century, or actually even before that, beginning in the 1500s, there was moral and spiritual renewal, um, which uh, was manifested, for example, in the 16th century. Bartolomeo de las Casas spoke out against the treatment of enslaved Native Americans and Africans in Hispaniola, and also spoke out against the encomiendas, which were essentially plantations. And I want to show you an image also that came about during the, um, created by abolitionists in 1787, which later became uh, nearly uh, ubiquitous. Benjamin Franklin said of it that it was equal to, well, actually this is a, updated version. The right is showing the fetus, but the, this was the best picture that I could get on short notice, showing um, the African saying, am I not a man? And its reverse side reads, whatsoever you would that men would do to you, do ye even so unto them, which is based on Mark 12, 7, Luke 6, 31. So my slide as the unwarmed, that's a discussion for another time. 
So I think, as uh, Dr. Rivers indicated, there was a concept of social dignity, which began to arise in the 19th century out of the spiritual renewals in England and the United States, leading to the anti-slavery and abolitionist movements. Harriet Beecher Stowe is, Stowe is considered unfashionable at the moment, but Langston Hughes noted that there was never a book so full of love as Uncle Tom's Cabin. However, as we look at these virtues, and I think Dr. Rivers went into this in great detail, there is this dichotomy between the virtues themselves rather than the essential nature of dignity. And so um, while I think Dr. Rivers has wrestled with the um, definitions of dignity and the five understand understandings of dignity, hierarchy, um, equal status, respect, dignified behavior, and dignity is the equal moral worth of human beings, these understandings are gonna come into conflict at different times and different places with different individuals. In any given situation, we must ask ourselves, which of these are we referring to? Because without a clear definition, they become like the proverbial tar baby that we talk about in, in Southern culture. As a close, I'd like to return to De La Vasquez's uh, picture. Um, I think we should pay some attention to the painting because if you look at the side, De La Vasquez is sitting there with his, uh, well, sitting or standing, I can't really tell, with a brush in his hand, and this painting is clearly unfinished. Carlos Fuentes, as an interesting point, considers the implications and says, does it not raise the possibility that everything in the world, this painting, but also this history, this narrative, is unfinished? And that more specifically, we are unfinished ourselves, men and women who cannot be declared complete enclosed within boundaries of finitude and servitude. And now let's look at the Chamberlain who's in the back. And I'm gonna show you another picture which kind of takes this out a little bit further. There's a Chamberlain in the back who is pulling back a uh, curtain over a doorway. And without the doorway, if that doorway wasn't there, this would be a very claustrophobic scene. You've got a lot of people jammed together and a lot of sort of things going on. But because of its geometric um, position, we as viewers are placed opposite this open doorway, looking through it to the light beyond. So the significance is even greater because of the figure of the Chamberlain. Is he coming or going? But in any event, what is important is that the openness of the doorway shows us that there is an outside, a world beyond, and the light of that world is available if we can just draw aside the curtain, as the Chamberlain has done. So there's some clear symbolic importance to this. Um, some people have suggested that this is genuine enlightenment and that the only way, the only the audience, only we in this picture can see that doorway and the light beyond. The, the other people, the dwarves and the infant and the chambermaids can't really see it. And only by standing outside of ourselves, outside of the paint, painting, is what they call the path to enlightenment discernible. But I would say it's not enlightenment, it's revelation. So if we combine these two elements, and I know I'm a minute or two over time, but I'm wrapping up, the unfinished canvas and the open door leading to the light, we see that this is another way of thinking about dignity. The concept of human dignity may be useful for allowing a dialogue to occur between those who fundamentally disagree about what it means to be human. And what the Chamberlain may be doing is inviting us to join an unfinished conversation. So taking this further and with this I will end, Velasquez is not trying to solve the very complicated relationships, hierarchies, status, and rank, or the question of dignity as an ennobling moral quality, or the paradoxes of gaze and viewpoint. If we accept that our brothers and sisters, those of whom Dr. Rivers brought before us, those whom Dr. Rivers brought before us in our, her presentation have intrinsic value and worth, then we have accepted the radical equality of the gospel. And we are, are articulating clearly what it means to be human, knowing that our Father God has called us, each of us, by name. We want to allow our Lord to pull aside the curtain so that we can look through the illuminated door into the realm of the Spirit and see his divine revelation regarding reconciliation. He's already, God has already outlined this in the scripture in Ephesians and our responsibility is to apply these clear teachings to help one another to know our God-given names because names indicate identity. Identity binds us together, helps us to know um, who we are, 
and who the other, who's no longer the other, as Martin Buber says, the I and the thou. And that's the ground of the inherent worth and dignity of a human person. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Evans. So thank you so much to, to Dr. Rivers and Dr. Uh, Wubenhorst. Thank you for that as well. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions, we, and then we have a lot of time for conversation during our reception. But so maybe ask like a, a couple. If anybody has a question, we have microphones. If you want to come up and ask a question, or if you prefer just to make it more informal and visit uh, in, in a collective way in our reception, that's fine too. But let's give folks a moment if they want to to come to the microphones and ask a couple questions. Oh, the husband of the speaker would like to ask a question. I guess that's OK. He's just always harassing me. That's right. <laughs> well, uh, I'm biased, obviously. Uh, I'd be interested uh, in Dr. Rivers, you sort of teasing out uh, uh, how the abortion, I mean, I, I love the, the, the visual, right, about um, and so I would be interested in getting your thinking on that because one part of the agenda that you've outlined has been uh, the social engineering that goes on and how the black community is disproportionately impacted on the question of abortion, which is a major league deal, which the pro-life community needs to do more about. So if we're pro-life, we have to be pro-life for everybody. So um, I'd, be glad, I'd be glad to say a few words, but I think absolutely, Monique, you should speak to this. Um, it is definitely the case that uh, black women are massively disproportionately involved in abortion. Uh, much higher abortion rates among them than among white women, higher than among Hispanic women. One important factor is the relationship to poverty. I was uh, asked to testify, uh, to you know, serve as an expert witness for one of the for a state where the there was an effort to end uh, support uh, uh, paying for abortion, and I was glad to do it. But I also wanted to draw the relationship between poverty and abortion rates, but that was frowned upon, right? It's okay to try, yeah, it's puzzling. But women turn to abortion very often out of desperation. Turn to abortion because they don't know how they're possibly going to make ends meet. Is that the right answer? No, it's not the right answer. But we need to do more to support women in that position. We need to do more to give them hope that they could actually raise this child. And I think the black church needs to do more so that there are fewer of these out of wedlock births. Fewer, a big, fewer women facing an unplanned pregnancy because they're not married. So I think that there is much to be done there, and I think it's important, uh, it's a hugely important, and it certainly speaks to the whole issue of dignity. Both of the fetus, I thought that was really a powerful image, that just as the argument was made that, um, uh, in the 19th century that blacks were not human, so now the argument has been made that, the, that fetus is not human. So it's really important for us to look at that intersection of those two issues. Thank you. Don't get me started on this, okay? Because <laughs> <laughs> Carter knows. Like, so um, I think there, it, I'm, I'm absolutely with you. I think that you know, we see the reversal from you know, in the early, late 50s, early 60s, where you had 80% of children being born into married households. Now it's perver precisely reversed. But I think with the abortion issue, we really, we really have got to take seriously the, the racial, enormous racial disparities. You know, African Americans are about 13 or 14 percent of the U.S. population, but one third of all abortions. And if you look at second trimester abortions, abortions that are done uh, after or at 14 weeks, um, 40 percent of those abortions are done in African American women. And since Roe v. Wade was started, about 16 million unborn African American children have been aborted, which is more than the entire population of African Americans in the United States. 
This has incredible significance because what it's done is change the population's structure. And so even though you hear people saying, oh, well, you know, in 30 years, the country's gonna be more brown, um, that's probably not gonna be the case because what's happening is that with, because of the number of abortions, there are fewer children, population structure is changing. And gradually, the African-American population is approaching a point of demographic collapse. So I can't go into a lot of detail, but I think that's absolutely right. And there really does need to be um, a serious discussion of this. The other day, I was doing a back of the envelope calculation on this. So if you include abortion, there are 1.5 million deaths from all causes, cancer, diabetes, homicide, HIV, of African Americans, but there are only 551,000 births. So just do the math, just do the math. That means the population is in a rapid decline. So, yeah. Jeff? Uh, thank you both so much. This was, I've been coming to this conference for, I've probably been to 15 of these conferences, and this is one of the very best uh, uh, plenary addresses I've heard. Thank you, Carter, for bringing them. Uh, so I, I appreciate the Velasquez as well. I also think he's one of the greatest painters of human dignity ever. And so I, I appreciate the, uh, the painting that you put up. Um, you said something about race as a category is not a biological uh, entity, it's not a biological uh, idea. And that is true. Um, there are people, though, who would say that we, and I agree with them, that we probably need to con conserve the, uh, the category simply to help elevate and to, uh, to bring people who have stuff, suffered for generations uh, up to the level uh, of, of the rest of the community. So I'd like to hear both of you reflect on that counterpoint of the usefulness of the category of race uh, for kind of repairing what damage has been done. Sure, I'll, I'll start, I'll start. So as a, as a scientist and researcher, I'm not ashamed of that, um, I think that it was really interesting. I would say about 20 years ago, there was a big academic brouhaha about how we should just eliminate the use of race or any of that in both sort of biomedical you know, patient records and research. And people were like, ancestry matters, okay? If you are African American or Han Chinese, you are at a higher risk for having the poss possibly having sickle cell genes, okay? They, they are positively associated with survival from malaria in, in Africa and used to be in China. So I think that we, if you're from the Mediterranean, you have a higher risk of thalassemia. I mean, we do have um, the fact to deal with that ancestry matters, but race is something entirely different. Race is leading to the things that Jackie was talking about, where this person has the same resume but diff different behaviors, you know. And, you know, we're, we're constantly addressing the, the distinction between racism and discrimination, right? I mean, racism is between your ears. No one can do anything like that, you know. I mean, do anything about that. That's a, a human being has to make a decision of their will that they want to change. And growth is painful and change is hard. But discrimination is what we want to do something about. And so to the extent that, wait, where did we go? <laughs> Oh, there you are, okay. <laughs> I was trying to look at you. So to the, to the extent that we can recognize ancestry or ethnicity as, for example, a risk factor for disease or a risk factor for discrimination, we should, we should recognize that. But the hierarchy of races, as Darwin said, that you know, the people on the low end are the aboriginals and Africans who are really not that far removed from the apes, and then you have the Indian and, and so on and so forth, that's what needs to be done away with. Because people will recognize, you know, one of the things in, in the South, we live in the South of North Carolina, and people will ask you, oh, where are your people from, okay? That's, uh, where, where is your family from? Are they from Minnesota, or, or originally did they come from Germany, like my wonderful husband there, who I will acknowledge is just awesome, but he's German, his people are from the Oldenburg, Oldenburg part of Germany. So that's, that's what we really need to focus on, is understanding that and doing away with the idea of race as a categorization. So I'll hand it to Jackie. So I, I really appreciate that question because it's certainly true that race is not a biolo biological reality, but it certainly is a social reality. It is a reality which is deeply rooted in American history and 
deeply implicated in the lives of many people. And it, it certainly is true that people can change, but there's an entire structure. Look, what has happened is that because of historic racism, there are entire uh, ways of living. The fact that black people live predominantly in inner city neighborhoods which are poor, don't have access to jobs, don't have access to good schools, we will not stop, get rid of that just by saying there is no more race. In, ta in fact, in France, the law is, at least it was last time I was there, that you could not collect data, statistics on race. But despite that, there was still racism. The fact that you don't collect the data, the fact that you deny that it exists does not eradicate it. And so I agree, and even the Supreme Court found that we will have to deal with race as a social reality while we work through the uh, pernicious effects of history. I hope that someday we'll be able to be able to, we will be able to say we're just going to think about ancestry and we will have eradicated the impact of the social construct of race. But we're not there. We're far from being there, as the data I presented shows. Well, friends, we're out of time for the formal portion of this conversation, but we can, I know, we're going to talk out there. People have drinks. They'll be happier. <laughs> they'll talk to you. It'll be great. So um, I would like to thank our amazing speakers again. Uh, and there's one thing, and we do have an extraordinary, as, as both Dr. Rivers and Dr. Wubenhorst have already said, the, the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture staff is peerless and yes. unrivaled in, in, in the world. Um, and there, and th and there will be a time for me to recognize them in a, in a fully appropriate way. But before we before we go on, I just want to say every good thing that happens to you all over the course of the next few days is because of Margaret Cabanis. Yes. Um, and and we'll talk we'll talk more about her later. But I just wanted to, to tease that up or to tee that up rather. Thank you so much for your attention. Let's go have some drinks and some food and continue our conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Carter. Thank you. <laughs>